So hello and welcome everyone to today's Bachelor of Applied Medical Sciences AMS tester session titled Staring Down the Bacterial Apocalypse and How We Can Fight Back. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Iris Feng and I am currently a year three student studying Applied Medical Sciences here at UCL. I am also your chair for this afternoon. We are hoping that this taster session will address those course specific questions that you may have and will help you to gain some insights into what it is really like to study in our Applied Medical Sciences undergraduate program. So this afternoon, we have our speakers, Professor Jennifer Ron and Dr. Dallas Houston. They will introduce you to some of the great science and medicine that you will learn as a student of Applied Medical Sciences here at UCL. Our speakers will also provide a summary of the Bachelor of Applied Medical Sciences program, and there will be a Q&A session for the second part of the event. The session is being recorded and will be made available shortly after on our website. And um, we are all here to respond to your questions, so please feel free to share any thoughts throughout using the Q&A function on Zoom. Now to introduce you to our speakers, we have Professor Jennifer Ron. Professor Ron is the head of the Center for Urological Biology, and she runs a research laboratory studying treatment-resistant urinary tract infection. Based in UCL Division of Medicine, she, asked, she is also a deputy director and admission tutor for applied medical sciences and the program lead for intercalated BSc in clinical sciences. And we also have Dr. Dallas Rustin. Dr. Rustin is a lecturer of medical sciences at UCL, where his teaching is focused on integrated medical science programs, including the applied medical sciences, and nutrition and medical science programs. Dr. Dallas Rustin is committed to continual development and innovation in pedagogy and connecting research and education. Now over to you, Professor Ron. Thank you so much. Thank and you so much, Iris. Thank you and welcome everybody to this webinar. Really excited to share a little bit about our course and give you a flavor of what it's like to learn in this course. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see D Dallas Iris? Can you see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Okay, so I we are assuming that a lot of you have probably already gone to Open Days and learned a little bit about our course. So I'm just going to be very brief. Again, just a little refresher on what this course is, and then we're going to dive into the taster, which is the fun bit. So. Uh, yes, yeah, it's a three year BSc program. The program director is Professor David Spratt. And our ethos is fusing science with medicine. So this is a course that fuses science and medicine because you, know, you can't really understand medicine if, if you don't understand the science behind it. And we think it's really important to learn both of those things in parallel. And our program sits within the, within the division of medicine at UCL, which is the largest um, department in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. And it's really research intensive. So we have lots of people studying a whole variety of diseases. And we have sort of clinical and non-clinical uh, academics. So we have doctors and we have scientists and they're working together. And we're also in contact with lots of world leading hospitals in London, teaching hospitals. And it's a really vibrant place, not only to study, but to do research and teaching and with, with absolutely um, amazing impact. So UCL came first in the entire United Kingdom for research power in medicine and health and life sciences in the uh, a recent assessment in 2022. So we're really proud of our record of research and teaching here at UCL. And yeah, just to summarize the course in a nutshell, we want to develop science graduates who are literate in medicine. So they understand enough about medicine in order to think deeply about um, sort of disease processes and how you might go about like, diagnosing or curing them. And you'll have a strategic advantage for any job where you, you require an understanding of both disciplines. And it's a very broad choice. So you within applied medical sciences, there are many different degrees, uh, types of degree that you could do. You could, you could take different modules and stitch, stitch together your own personal sort of pathway through. So if you're interested in cancer, we can you can steer that way. If you're interested in immunology, if you're interested in um, 
a wide variety of different things. AMS is a great place because it helps you um, work out what you want to do. And there's all sorts of things that you can do. We'll talk a little bit, just a few minutes about the kind of jobs that our graduates get. And I just want to, it's a very interesting thing about this particular degree. We often get students applying who did not get into medical school. They wanted to go into medical school and they didn't make it. So they ended up with us. And we have a really good track record of getting people into medical school after AMS. So we, we get people into uh, first year medical school and uh, graduate medical school. And that's one of the top destinations. But sometimes the, the people who wanted to be medical school come to AMS and realize, you know what, I really like science. And they go off and become scientists and get PhDs. So you never really know what you want to do till you study it. So we, we think this is a great place to really work out. If you're interested in science, you're interested in medicine, you're not sure what you want to do, this is a fantastic option. And basically, our students either go straight into employment and really, really good jobs. Here's a list of clinical trials management, consultancies, public health, government. We've had people working in number 10 Downing Street, um, doing science communication, teaching, things like that. And we've also had a lot of people going on to further study. So medicine and PhD are the top destinations. And, um, and then masters. So going on to, to study a master's degree before going on to do a PhD, that's also very popular. And this is the breakdown. So yeah, master's is probably the top destination, but then those students go on to do PhDs. Medicine also a big, huge chunk of our um, exit destinations. So that's it. Um, that was just a, a brief um, summary of applied medical sciences. And if you have any questions about the course, do put your questions into the Q&A function on the webinar. Now we're going to segue quite nicely into our taster. So we're going to try to give you a feel for the kind of things that you might learn uh, when you are studying on our course. OK, so today we're going to talk about something really scary, which is the antimicrobial resistance crisis. And I, I just think it's really interesting to think about us on the planet. So here we are, two, so the earth is 4.5 billion years old. So it's a very old and bacteria came onto the planet, sort of came into being three and a half billion years ago. And the first eukaryotes didn't come onto the scene until one and a half or two billion years ago. So bacteria have been here for a very long time. And we, it's a little pixel on my timeline, you know, we've only been around for 200,000 years and compared with the bacteria, we're just really new, we're newbies, right? So the bacteria were here first, they know all the tricks and, and because of this, they are very, very problematic. Uh, and you, I'm sure you've all heard of the devastating bacterial diseases that have caused problems for humans since uh, we were able to record them in history. The Black Death in particular, killing up to 200 million people in Asia, which is about a third of the population of Europe and it, during the medieval period. And that was, you know, there was nothing you could do. If you got sick with the Black Death, you, you maybe you could have your priest sprinkle some fairy dust on you but there, and pray for you, but there was nothing to be done. And all of this havoc, this terrible devastation caused by a tiny, tiny little thing that's only two microns big. I mean, these are tiny little things, yet they cause such massive human suffering. And I think it's really remarkable. And, and people always ask me, well, you know what? We're, we're highly evolved mammals. We have immune systems. Why is it that these tiny little creatures uh, can make us sick even today? And the answer is that they have an amazing arsenal of tricks. So they, they have a way, they have ways of getting around our defenses. And there are literally hundreds, maybe if not thousands of different ways that different bacteria can get around our immune system. Here's just two of my favorite examples, just for fun. So the first one is Escherichia coli, which is a very, very common bacteria. You've probably heard of it, heard of E. coli. It lives in your guts. Uh, it's a friendly bacteria normally, but if it gets into your bladder, if the wrong E. coli gets into your bladder, it can cause this terrible infection called urinary tract infection. Hopefully none of you have had it, but it is very common. And when UTI, uh, when, when you have a UTI, the bacteria E. coli is normally shaped like a little cigar or a Tic Tac, um, and you can see them here. But when they go into the bladder, they form these long filamentous spaghetti-like shapes. And these are really interesting. I've got a cool video here which is so what you're looking at here, the gray stuff is our bladder cells. And the, these are the cigar shaped E. coli, the normal shaped. And this green thing is one of the long filaments um, 
of this sort of like the, the special trick that the bacteria does. And then these blue things are the white blood cells that are trying to gobble up the bacteria. And see, let's see what happens. So the white blood cells, which are blue here, are gobbling up all the cigar shapes. Yeah, oops, that didn't work. Um, let's look at that again. But they cannot seem to eat the green thing. Uh, so we don't even know why. Either they can't see it or it's not very tasty. <laughs> so it's really amazing. They're, they're completely invisible. So the immune system tries to get rid of it and it can't. And here's another example. I'm just going to stop this video. This is Listeria, which is another quite nasty bug. And Listeria is really interesting because it spends its entire life cycle inside of our cells. So here they are, these little black things. If I play this video, you can see that they're rocketing around our cells. And what they're trying to do is push into the next cell. And there's one up here on the top that's trying and can't. Um, and when they're inside the cell, they're completely safe. Like they can't be eaten by the immune system. They can't be attacked. They just do what they're doing and spread from cell to cell. And so that's another adaptation. So bacteria have thousands of these things. And before we had any drugs against bacteria, the most 30% of all deaths were associated with an infection. So infections were deadly. You know, you could get scratched by a thorn and die. That's, and so it was really bad. And it wasn't until Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in 1920, late 1920s that things started to turn around. You probably all heard the story about how he had a plate of bacteria in his laboratory and a little splodge of mold landed on it. And then he noticed the next day that there was a zone around the mold where nothing was growing. The bacteria couldn't seem to get anywhere near the mold. And that's when he realized that the mold was producing something that was killing bacteria. But he, he wasn't able to solve the problem. It was too difficult for him and he gave up. But eventually two other people, Florian Chain, shared the Nobel Prize for penicillin which is pretty amazing this is penicillin it is the most ridiculously simple molecule you can imagine look how small it is this little thing can stop bacteria in its tracks and um, it does that by interfering with the bacteria's ability to repair itself this is penicillin g penicillin was not invented by bacteria to for us to fight uh, bacteria with it's a natural product it's an ancient product there's been penicillins and other antibiotics around for billions of years and the bacteria use them to communicate and to fight each other but we are exploiting that as a drug and lots and lots of antibiotics were discovered in the 20th century uh, and in fact so many were discovered that people stopped trying to discover them you know we got 20 now we don't need any more this is what people thought but actually even Alexander Fleming was terrified that, that the antibiotics might prove to be useless. And he was even so worried about it that he spent half of his Nobel Prize speech worrying about the fact that he had noticed in his lab that sometimes the bacteria could start to resist the antibiotics. And he was worried that was going to happen in people. He was like a time traveler from the future. <laughs> um, he was really probably not very much fun at this party. Um, and it came to pass within um, that year, even people started to die from uh, people started to have infections that were resistant to penicillin and, and dying. So um, resistance began to happen. And, and what is people often ask me, what is antibiotic resistance? What do you mean by that? What I mean is that the, the bacteria can actually create uh, molecules that can destroy an antibiotics. So in this example, this bacteria can produce a, pro, uh, a molecule called beta lactamase, which acts like little scissors that just destroy the penicillin. They cleave the penicillin at this four membered ring here and it flops open and it can no longer do its job. So you can give, if a bacteria has beta lactamase, you can give it all the penicillin you want and nothing will happen. And these things are really easily spread. If you have a resistance gene, you can pass it to like a business card to another bacteria very easily and they can just spread all over the world. Just to give you an example, this is a cartoon I've made. This is a Petri dish and all of the white bacteria are sensitive to penicillin and there's one mutant here he's maybe he's got the beta lactamase gene he's resistant and what happens if i put penicillin on this plate what will happen is all of the white ones will die and then the red ones will spread and imagine this petri dish is not a petri dish imagine it's a an airplane or a hospital or an entire country <laughs> so once you start taking lots of antibiotics you're going to kill the bugs that are killed by antibiotics, but the ones that are resistant are going to take over. And that is antimicrobial resistance. That's how it works. It's basically 
evolution and natural selection. And the, what's driving this evolution is a complete uh, overuse of antibiotics uh, by not only people, but, um, but agriculture. So antibiotics are very cheap. You look here on the internet, you can buy it for 30p for a pack. Um, you can buy it without a prescription in many countries. You can go online and buy it. That means that people might get a cold that's caused by a virus, but they think, oh, I'll just buy some antibiotics and take them. What harm could it do? Well, actually, it can do a lot of harm because it will drive antimicrobial resistance. The antibiotics are in our water supply, they're in our soil, and they're basically killing off all the sensitive ones and causing the resistant ones to spread. And it's gotten so bad. Um, uh, so we, we, I told you that we only have about you know, maybe 20 to 30 different kinds of antibiotics and people have stopped discovering new ones, but resistance to all of them is on the rise. And there's been a complete discovery void ever since. So the, the last new antibiotics were marketed in, you know, in, in the early 2000s. There's been a few discoveries recently, but it takes 20 years about to go from a discovery to actually a marketed drug. And at the moment, we don't have anything. <laughs> and so we have fewer and fewer drugs at work, fewer and fewer drugs being discovered and resistance rising. So you can see that's a perfect storm of, of scariness. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you might think, oh, this is just some time in the future. We don't have to worry about this now. That's not true. It's actually already happening. This is a really scary graph. And it's showing the number of deaths associated with various diseases um, that are antimicrobial resistant. So for example, um, this many deaths uh, per year caused by lower uh, respiratory infections that are resistant to antibiotics. 4.95 or practically 5 million deaths every year associated with antibiotic resistance. That means, you know, you get this lung infection, they try every single antibiotic on the shelf, none of them work and you die. <laughs> so this is almost like going back to the time before Alexander Fleming, right? It's going back to a time when even a simple operation or a cut on your finger could potentially kill you. And unless we get a handle on this problem, we may go back to a medical dark ages where that is going to start happening. That's really scary. I don't want to, end, I'm not going to end on it. Dr. Rolston is going to give you a really nice, hopeful lecture. It's a little bit scary, I think. AMR is scary, and I think we need to take action now. And I think the people who come onto the Applied Medical Sciences course can be instrumental in helping in this fight. So if you're interested in infectious diseases, and if you want to save the planet, I think coming to Applied Medical Sciences would be a good place to start. So come join us, um, learn about this terrible thing, and, and help us come up with great new ideas. I've listed a few new ideas here. I mean, we are there's some interesting things going on with probiotics. So using friendly bacteria to fight bad bacteria, phage therapy, which is something that Dr. Rolson's gonna talk, tell you about in a minute. Vaccines, we, we stopped using vaccines for bacteria because we had antibiotics, but now we need to go back to them, I think. And then uh, some other interesting dr uh, drugs that aren't antibiotics, but might, might block the bugs other ways. So there's, there are new ideas out there, but we need more of them and we need more people working on this. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Rulston. And if you have any questions about the science, you can, feel, you can put that into the chat as well. We can answer those later too. So I think Dr. Rulston is going to share his screen. Here we go. Looks great. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to be talking about phage therapy. You might have heard of phage therapy. Uh, it's been in the news quite recently, but yeah, I've titled the start of the, the presentation, the antibacterials gym, but not as we know them. Bit of a Star Trek reference, and I think it lends well to this sort of alien type structure that is the bacteria phage. Okay, so, uh, bacteriophages were originally sort of observed by a bacteriologist, British bacteri bacteriologist called Frederick, T Frederick Tort uh, in 1915 when he was working on bacteria and he noticed these glassy transformations in his culture. He didn't know what they were, um, but attributed them to something um, smaller than bacteria because he could run his bacterial culture through um, a filter, which would get rid of the bacteria. And there was something else. This, this thing that was causing these glassy formations was still there. So he said, maybe a protein, maybe a virus. 
Two years later, independently, French-Canadian microbiologist Felix Durrell, we'll hear a lot about him if you are interested in bacteriophage therapy, uh, he confirmed the existence of something called bacteriophages, or he termed them bacteriophages, because he thought that they were, he didn't know what they were, but he thought they were something that ate bacteria. So he could put them into his culture and come back the next day and his culture would be eaten. So he termed them bacteria eaters or bacteriophages. So they were initially, uh, because they had this property, they were initially uh, explored as a potential therapeutic agent for bacterial infections. This is before antibiotics. This is before penicillin. So it kills bacteria. So why not try and use it as a treatment? And this is where Felix Durrell really sort of thought about these bacteriophages as a, as a treatment. And um, he, he was quite a flamboyant character. He traveled to Georgia um, not in America, uh, just south of Russia, and met a fellow, another flamboyant fellow called uh, George Aliava. And George Aliava was uh, quite rich and started an institute, a whole institute looking at bacteriophages and how to use them as therapy. And the Aliava Institute still is a world leader in phage therapy today. Now, something happened. We've already covered the discovery of penicillin, 1928. Sir Alexander Fleming goes on holiday, comes back, and his plate had been contaminated with this mold, and it was killing the bacteria. Took a few years, but then eventually this penicillin, this drug that the, that the mold was producing, was produced into a usable antibiotic, the first antibiotic that was derived naturally from, from fungi. And the West had its first antibiotic. Around that time, something else happened, World War II, and the penicillin saved countless lives. And the West really took to antibiotics and phage therapy fell away. But behind the Iron Curtain, Georgia and Russia continued using phage therapy and developing phage therapy, looking for new phages as well. And it's continued that way to this day. So we can see, uh, yeah, so early phage research in, in uh, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union there. So what are phages? So bacteria, bacteriophages or phages for short? Well, like I said, they were termed bacteria-eating viruses, but they don't actually eat the bacteria. So they're naturally occurring predators of bacteria. So they seek out and infect bacteria. They have a, a quite a a good specificity for, either for a single species or even strain level specificity. And as, as Professor Rohn said about the evolution of bacteria, phages have been around for just as long and they've co-evolved. So every time the bacteria figure out a way of trying to beat these, the phages are equally as adept to overcome them. Now they're the most uh, abundant biological entity, are they, are they viruses living, but they are a biological entity. They are estimated to be in the region of 10 to the 31 phages on earth. Now that's quite a hard uh, number to sort of visualize, but it's 10 million, 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 million viruses. So if we, they're, they're about uh, 20 to 200 microns in length, so if we took the bacteriophages and stuck them end to end, uh, they would reach for between 100 and 200 million light years. So that's 7 point, so 6.7 quadrillion trips to the sun. Yeah, 42 times to the Andromeda galaxy and back. So they're, they're, they're hugely abundant. And they're, 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 they're found wherever you find bacteria, and that's practically everywhere including within us. So they basically consist of nucleic acid, typically DNA, but some RNA, uh, some virus, some of these bacteriophages are RNA, uh, hold RNA within them, and they're wrapped up in a protein coat. And as I said, they look a little bit like an alien lander, maybe a spider with a very long neck uh, there in the top right. Um, they have overall a similar structure, but there's lots of diversity within them. And they're obligate 
intracellular parasites. So they must inject their DNA. They can't replicate by themselves their viruses. So what they do is they inject their genetic material and use the machinery of our cells to reproduce. And once they're in the cell and they reproduce, they uh, repackage back into a virus, viral particle and eventually the cell will burst. There's other uh, processes at play, so their genome can get incorporated into the genome of the bacterium that it is infecting as well. Now, we've mentioned briefly uh, antimicrobial resistance. So, yes, it's a massive problem. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much further here. And we are, we do have this discovery void uh, in terms of new antibiotics. So it's a very worrying time. So what can we do? We can take a book out of Felix Durrell's book and consider using bacteriophages as therapy. So I hope I've told you already that phages are everywhere, which makes them easy to find and relatively cheap to characterize, to, to sequence their genome, to look at them under a, an electron microscope and figure out what sort of viruses they are. They've also got quite a good degree of host specificity, ranging, as I said, from single uh, species of bacteria right down to even single strains of bacteria. They're autocatalytic. So um, we can put them into a system, for example, our in an, an infection within our body. And if the host is there and the bacteriophage recognizes that host, it will infect it, kill it. And then once there is no host around, those bacteriophages are cleared from the system. And they appear to be clinically safe. These phages have been used in Georgia, particularly, and Russia uh, for approximately 100 years uh, with, with only few reports of uh, adverse effects. Now, when you consider that between 15 and 20% of antibiotics uh, uh, prescriptions or treatments uh, result in some form of adverse effect, then they really do um, sort of appear to be quite clinically safe. And there's research out there that shows if you infect a particular bacteria that is antimicrobial resistant with the phage that will infect it, it will basically turn its energy to fighting the phage and it may lose its antibiotic resistance. So there's a really good sort of possible strategy there. And finally, some of these viruses have anti uh, biofilm um, properties. So they can break down biofilms. Biofilms are communities of bacteria, think, like uh, dental plaque. Um, and within these, they can really ramp up their antimicrobial resistance. So if these phages can break down those, those biofilms, then it's another sort of bow, another string in their bow, if you will. But there are many uh, hurdles to overcome. There's lots of regulations when it comes to trying to treat something, to trying to treat someone with these bacteriophages. We need to make sure that they're safe. We need to make sure that they've been produced the proper way and there's no contaminants. Now, there's also issues around funding um, and intellectual property. You can't own a, a biological entity. You can't uh, own a phage. And that makes it difficult to bring in funding because at the end of the day, uh, funders want to get a return on their investment. So it's very difficult, um, but that landscape is changing and there's more funding becoming available because of the importance of antimicrobial resistance. There's also issues around making sure that they're safe, making sure that they work, so performing clinical trials, etc. And because you need to find the right phage to treat the infection, it can take a little bit longer than giving someone an antibiotic. And then there's issues around making sure you've got the right dose and transporting it, et cetera, as well. But yes, there is a real interest in bacteriophage therapy, including uh, government. So there was a House of Commons Select Committee last year looking at how important antimicrobial resistance is and how we can properly fund research into alternatives, including bacteriophage therapy. Uh, this handsome chap is uh, Dr. Jean-Paul Pionnet, is the head of um, one of the research labs in a hospital in Belgium, uh, one of the leaders, one of the global leaders in phage therapy. And he recently published a paper, him and his group recently published a paper looking at the first 100 patients that have received phage therapy in Belgium. And it's really a sort of catch-all um, 
not looking for success or failure, just an overview of the first 100 cases. And it's a really interesting read that, that, that shows that the, there is plenty of potential here for using bacteriophages as therapy. Another interesting project going on in the UK is that run by Dr. Ben Temperton down at the University of Exeter, and he started a citizen phage library. So he wants to build up a bank of phages. So if people do have infections, uh, he can go to a phage library and find potential matches um, to treat these infections. So what he does is he gets individual citizens uh, to go out and collect samples, then they send them to him, register where they've found those samples, send them to him, and in his lab, he tries to isolate phages. And there is certainly some success here. Um, an interesting uh, case where a phage against a bacterium called Pseudomonas aeruginosa was found in a chicken coop. Uh, and the person who found that, uh, Dr. Temperton, contacted them and said, well, it's up to you to name it and they named it Kylie Mineg. Um, there's also another virus who tr which uh, attacks Pseudomonas called Danny Mineg. So yeah, go, go out, find phage, and, and you can name it whatever you want. So there's various different approaches. We can use single phages. We can also use something called a phage cocktail, where we use various numbers of phages, either against a particular species, which uh, sort of opens up the, the range that we use, or we can even use different phages that target different species, com um, combine them into one treatment as well. And you can see some of those products that are packaged by the Eliabi Institute in Georgia over there on the right. Now we've got an interesting case going through um, our hospital at the Royal Free at the moment and the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, where we had a patient who had a total knee replacement back in 1989. Around 2020, uh, there was some complications and we found out that there was a Staphylococcus aureus, a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus in this patient's joint. Now it's metacillin susceptible and it's quite susceptible to many other drugs as well. But the patient has lots of other issues such as allergy to different antibiotics. Um, and it's been very difficult to treat. So they've been on various antibiotics and it hasn't really, um, it hasn't really treated the infection and the infection keeps coming back. They have to go in and drain um, all the pus that's forming around this joint and the patient's in a really bad way. So they've applied for the, um, some compassionate use of using bacteriophages to treat this patient. And we have, um, we've obtained the isolate from the patient and we've sent it to France to be tested against various phages. We've found some matches and those phages and the isolate have now been sent to Belgium, to Dr. P uh, Dr. Pierre's lab, who is working to formulate a, um, a, a phage therapy option. So we're gonna very soon hopefully be treating this patient, considering that they have had issues since 2020, to get to 2024, we can see that this is not a quick process. Um, but hopefully we can bring that, that duration down in the future. So very briefly about my research on phage therapy, um, I look at bone and joint infections as well as skin and soft tissue infections. So I look at particularly two organisms, one called Cutibacterium acnes, um, which as you may so spot causes acnes vulgaris, the, the skin condition, but also causes periprosthetic and joint infections. Uh, and another one called Staphylococcus aureus, which again is quite a common skin, um, part of our skin microbiota. Um, I look at, look, look at using antibiotics and bacteriophages in combination and looking at whether we can increase the activity of these two components um, by bringing them together. And I also look at isolating uh, bacteriophages from the environment that have potential for treatment. So uh, sequence their genome and look at them under an electron microscope. Uh, yeah, an electron microscope that you can see there uh, in the bottom right. Um, if you are interested in bacteriophages uh, and want to do some more reading, um, I would point you to this excellent book by Tom Island, uh, all about bac bacteriophages. So it covers many of the aspects that I've, um, I've spoken about today, and it's an excellent read. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Professor Ron and Dr. Dallas Rustin, for your fantastic and insightful introduction. So, as I can see, there are already some very great questions being asked by our students. Um, the first question is about E. coli. Is E. coli shape change a recent mutation, or has it always been able to do that? That's a good question. I, I assume it's been able to do this for millions of years. Uh, it hasn't been studied very much, but it's it's basically it divides it divides itself without cutting itself in half. Because bacteria normally, when they divide, they get a little bit bigger than they they cut themselves and then they divide. But the it's not really a mutation; it's a process. They decide not to cleave. So yeah, it's just something that bacteria do all sorts of weird and crazy things uh, in the body. Uh, when you start to look, there, there's just uh, lots of morphology changes, shape changes, very common in the bacterial kingdom. I, I assume this is millions, if not billions of years old. And how does back to, uh, how, there's another person asking, how do they, how does penicillin stop division? I didn't go into this because- Yeah, if you, if you want, I can take that one. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. So the bacterial cell wall, there's a component called peptidoglycan that's kind of these building bricks that build up the bacterial cell wall and give it structure, make it tough. And there's a protein that comes along and links these bricks together. And it's called a penicillin binding protein. But what it basically does is just links all these bricks together and builds up that peptidoglycan layer and makes that cell really tough. What happens is when penicillin gets in there, it blocks the site where that penicillin binding protein comes in to link those bricks. So it doesn't, and then you can't build that sort of that brick wall and the bacteria basically break down. So it doesn't actually stop the bacteria from dividing. It just stops it being able to build its brick wall on the outside. Yeah, then I, we have a attendee asking the very good question, how can antibiotic overuse in agriculture affect humans? That's a really good question. The reason is when you give a cow lots of antibiotics, they urinate into the grass, They this ends up in the water supply. All of the bacteria that are exposed to antibiotics in the environment will eventually, could be persuaded to <laughs> become resistant, right? So for example, you've got lots of bacteria in the field, the cow is urinating antibiotics all over the field, all of the bacteria that are sensitive to, to this antibiotic will die, and all the ones that are resistant will start spreading. So the more you have agriculture dosed, uh, the more the environment just becomes saturated with antibiotics. And it's just like that Petri dish I showed you, the more antibiotics that are in circulation or, that are around us, the more the bacteria are being selected to be resistant. So that, that is the answer. And a lot of, it's really cool. They give antibiotics to cows, not to protect them from disease because it makes them slightly bigger. So nobody knows why, but if you give antibiotics to a cow, you get a slightly bigger cow. So the farmer thinks, oh yeah, slightly bigger cow, more money when I sell my cow. So it's, it's, they're even not given for disease. They're given for this crazy, very slight growth benefit that, but, but, but the damage that that does is, is immense. This, maybe you want to take this one, Dallas, the next one. Yeah, yeah. so how can bacteria lose their anti antibiotic resistance when fighting phages? Is their resistance not due to mutations in their genetic code? Excellent question. Good question. Um, so I'll, I'll address the first point. So um, one way that bacteria can uh, develop antimicrobial resistance is, as Dr. as Professor Rohn was saying, is building, is making these, pro these proteins, these enzymes that break down the antibiotic that's attacking them. Now, what happens is if the bacteria is infected with a phage, it has its own immune system. And part of this, you might have heard of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Um, so what it needs to do is take its focus off, what it needs to do is, is basically produce its immune system very quickly in huge quantities. And it takes that focus, it takes the machinery away from producing those enzymes that are going to break down the antibiotic to focus it on the attack from the bacteriophages. And that's one way that they can revert to a susceptible sort of phenotype. I can take the next one. Can cytotoxic T cells kill the whole cell, which stops bacteria from reproducing? That's a good question. So 
it's true that if you've got an, in, uh, an infection inside your cells, like I showed you that listeria um, cell, in theory, yes, the immune system could target that, but sometimes the bacteria infect the immune system. So they'll go and infect the neutrophils, the police, it's like it's like the burglars take over the police cars, <laughs> essentially. You end up with the, the immune system getting attacked. And sometimes the, the bacteria can't be seen. Sometimes it, sometimes they get eaten by a, a big white blood cell, but then they can escape and, and get out. So really, yes, the, the immune system is great, but the bacteria are all over that. <laughs> they, they've just had so many millions of years to work out how our bodies work. And I'm afraid they can often get around it. And this is why we really need to have drugs when we get sick. We really need antibiotics or something or phage therapy or something because our immune systems just can't, they just aren't up to the job. Even though we're really smart and we're on the top of the food chain, we're, we're really at the mercy of these little things. Right. This so next, next question, is a tricky yeah, one. why does the size of the plaque of a of the same phage vary from one host to another that are susceptible to the uh, that are sensitive to the phage. Now, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so once, so let's start with the the very start of the process. The bacteria, rec sorry, the the phage recognizes the bacteria through receptors on those little tail fibers. Um, so that recognition can be mediated by the amount of receptors on the surface of that particular bacterium. So that's one way that might cause variations. Then the process of um, getting the genetic information inside and hijacking that machinery is, is quite complex. Um, and there's various steps along there. Um, and one can be the variation in the size of the genome and the amount of um, genetic material that's coming from those phages getting inside the cell and being transcribed and translated at different rates. Okay. Um, why hasn't phage therapy received a wide ad adoption? As I think, I think uh, Dr. Rulston kind of covered this. The reason why we stopped doing phage therapy in the West is because we had antibiotics and we had a golden century of, you know, lots of antibiotics. Um, we didn't think we needed something fussy, like phage therapy is not easy, right? It's as, mm. as I think uh, he so nicely outlined, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a faff. You know, you have to find a personalized thing and grow it up. And antibiotics, you just pop a pill. How, who can compete with that? It's now, only now that the antibiotics don't work anymore, that we're desperately realizing that we need alternatives. And that is why it's only been, and I say it's only been recently, but we've known about this problem for generations, but nobody's mm. done anything about it. It just got worse and worse and worse. Yeah, another aspect of that is that any any treatment comes along, even if a new antibiotic came along or a, or a statin to decrease your blood pressure or whatever, we want to make sure that it's safe. And even though they're being used quite sort of secretly in Georgia, they don't sort of, like, for various reasons, it's quite a sort of secretive um, thing. And it's only now becoming more available, the willingness to share that information. But we want to make sure that they're safe and that they work as they're supposed to as well. Yeah, you have to be very careful with new new therapies. And speaking of which, this is a great question here. Is there any enzyme that can digest a bacteria? This is exactly the kind of thinking that we need. Like when I'm sitting in my classes sometimes and I'm talking about this problem, I'll have a student raise their hand and say, Oh, why do we find an enzyme that can this is a great there there are. I mean, there there are some challenges to using enzymes as therapies, but this is the kind of fresh thinking that we really need. Mm. Um, Really, uh, that's a great question. And, and yeah, there are um, people on, thinking on that, about it, things like in, this. In the sort of bacteriophage biosphere, there are these uh, <laughs> enzymes called endolysins that bacteria that bacteriophage use to break out of the cell. So they go into the cell, they reproduce, you get lots of bacteriophages. They need to get out of the cell, so they produce endolysins. And that is one uh, area of, of folks, these bacteriophage produced enzymes. Uh, as treatment for these bacteria. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Endolysins. How does the bacterium fight off the phage? I think you, you can maybe address that one as well. You were talking about CRISPR-Cas9. Yeah, I was mentioning CRISPR-Cas9. So um, I mentioned briefly that bacteriophages have these two lifestyles. So they have this lytic phase where the, bac where the bacteriophage comes in, injects the material, 
makes lots of copies of itself, reassembles into multiple phages and then bursts out of the cell. So lysis, lytic. Um, there's another uh, lysogenic phase where the bacteria, once the, sorry, where the bacteriophage inject their genetic material, the bacteria incorporates that into its genome. And this acts as a, an immune system for the bacteria. So if they get infected by a phage, they can go to their genome, find a little bit of phage uh, DNA that's in there uh, and use that as a copy, uh, as a sort of an immune system to produce, um, yeah, to produce an immune response against the phage, um, the invading phage, if you will. And there's a question here about it. I love this question because this is going to head this head to head, Dr. Rulston and myself. If resistance did not exist, which would be more effective on a wide scale, phages or penicillin? Uh, it's got to be penicillin. Come on, I mean, penicillin. it's a yeah. pill. I, oh, I still love I still love my antibiotics. Don't you're worry. Gonna, you're going to agree with me on that <laughs> not one. Not a complete convert. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's as we said, it's it's. it's it's a pill, you pop it, right? Versus yeah. these phages are a bit faffy at the moment. So. Inc incredibly effective when they do work yeah, and they use correctly. I have to say there's, that was the last question, but we still have 10 minutes and we have Iris here who's a current student. So I thought some of you might wanna ask some questions about what it's like to be a student. If you wanna ask her about the AMS course, uh, please do uh, pop it in the chat or um, yeah, we're really, and maybe just to warm, since we have a few minutes, maybe Iris, you could say a little bit about why you chose applied medical sciences and what you like about it or don't like about it. Feel, feel free to be honest. <laughs> oh, and for that, um, I remember there was a question that is commonly asked by students who are prospective to apply to applied medical sciences, which is, um, what is the essential difference between AMS and MVBS and um, biomedical, biomedical sciences. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously MBBS is medical school and that is not what AMS is, but yeah, biomedical sciences is an excellent course at UCL. Um, I'll credit to them, uh, but it's more sciencey. So we're more, there's more medical content in, in AMS, a lot more medical content. And we get you taught, often get taught by clinicians. You learn about diseases. Um, whereas biomedical science is more sort of straight biology. So they're, they're very different. So if you're not as interested in medicine, biomedical sciences might be a better choice. Oh, there's another question about science. <laughs> we could, are probiotics useful in, in place of antibiotics? I mean, probiotics is in its infancy, the, the, the gut microbiome and everything. I mean, maybe you know, the fecal microbiota transplant might be something we could talk about. I mean, there's very little, I mean, it's it's really new, this whole gut microbiome and how it controls our health and our keeps us healthy. And, and the fact that you can cure some gut diseases by ingesting the microbiota of a healthy person is quite amazing. And I think in the next 20, 30, 40 years is going to be an absolute explosion of new treatments based on probiotics. At the moment, it's quite unregulated. You know, you got Zoe, <laughs> you've got sort of supplements and yogurts and things. And I think there's not a lot known. And, and are they going to be as good as antibiotics? Mm, probably not. But on the other hand, you know, uh, there's, there's so much research we need to do in that. I'm personally quite interested in probiotics. And I think um, it'd be, if you're interested in probiotics, this would be a good place to learn more about it because we've got we've got all sorts of really interesting research going on at UCL uh, around that. People are desperate to talk about the science. This is really great. Do you want to, Dallas? You want to take the next one? Aside from faith, oh. what else, and probiotics? There's not yeah. much vaccines. Yeah, vaccines, there's a lot of, uh, as we mentioned, enzymes and other bacterial factors, antimicrobial peptides. Um, I mean, very similar approaches to what we did with antibiotics, sort of hijacking the system that has, you know, th that they use to sort of fight each other and taking them and, and turning them for our gain, um, as we did with antibiotics. So, yeah, there's, there, there are a few different approaches. 
Um, I can't sort of list them off the top of my head at the minute. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's not much to be honest, and and that's why we really need brilliant new ideas. Yeah. That's, there's another course. Maybe Iris can answer this course related oh, one. Of course. Yeah. Um, this question is about: Is the course especially lab based, and is some of the course um, dedicated to just lab time? Um, I would say for year one and two, most of the time we spend our um, a split between lectures and tutorials, and we also have some online materials to view. And you would have about for year one and two, you would have about um, one day per week for um, training in lab about um, techniques. And in year three, you will be having the chance to have um, to participate in your dissertation research project. And based on that, you could choose um, um, either lab-based project or literature review. And the lab-based projects are um, very diverse. It could range from like neuroscience to oncology and to immuno immunology studies. So it really depends on your interest. Somebody wants to know how listeria gets into a cell. It's actually a good, it's a, so listeria is, is often spread by contaminated food. I believe it's like if you don't pasteurize your milk, if you eat uh, cheeses that aren't pasteurized, but you can just get it from a bodily contact with, you know, just general hygiene. I think it's quite interesting because I, I did tell you that listeria had to be inside cells to replicate. So you might wonder how, how does it get into the human, the human body? I actually don't know. It may, it may form spores. Do you know? I'm not an expert on listeria. I just, I'm a big fan of that video. Yeah. Because yeah. it, it's an obligate it is, it, is, it, is, it is normally contaminated food. That's why you use yeah. listeria. Yeah, but if it's, it's probably not free in the food, is it? Because it's it likes to be inside a cell. Maybe it, it's not it, obligate. It, it, yeah, it's interesting. It can grow at four degrees. So even if you put things in the fridge, and it actually it, it has a sort of response to being at four degrees that when you take it out, it, it sort of grows a bit yeah. quickly. You put it back in the fridge and then it grows a bit more. Yeah, so it's, it's a really a interesting. Way. And it, yeah, and it's tumbling motility is beautiful. Indeed. And there's there's a whole movement in America now to, to drink raw milk, but mm. that's just not a good idea. <laughs> Don't do it. Okay, what else do we have? Oh, here's another UCL question. Oh, I, I'll answer this because I'm the admissions tutor. Can you transfer between AMS and other courses like biomedical sciences? The first thing I can tell you is you can easily transfer between courses that are in the same faculty. So there are six courses in our faculty. There's like cancer, immuno there's immunology, there's cancer, sports medicine. In the first year, at the end of the first year, you can transfer between AMS and any of those. And it's very flexible and really nice. Biomedical sciences, in theory, you could transfer, but only if they have room for you. So we don't have an agreement with them. If they had room for you and you had the right modules, um, they may take you, but there's no guarantee. But we absolutely guarantee that if you want to switch between any of the sister courses in our faculty, you can do that with you know just the click of a button. That's not difficult. So that's quite nice. You might find yourself sitting in AMS and thinking, I'm really looking forward to all my cancer lectures. I kind of wish I had specialized in cancer. Well, you can. You can swap to the to the cancer BSc, and I think that's a really nice. Um, it's a really nice flexibility that we have. Do you have any comments about that, Iris? Um, I know some some of my colleagues um, are transferred from nutrition to AMS, and I also know some colleagues um, who transferred from MBBS to AMS. Oh wow. So it's, actually quite flexible inside our department. Okay, industry placements. There's no, there's no sort of formal way to get a placement in AMS, but we do have quite a number of students do summer projects and summer internships. I don't know, Iris, if you have, if you or any of your friends have done this. Yes, I've done plenty of summer internships. Um, I think placements are usually um, quite long and would take about a year or so to finish. So um, as our degree isn't having a sandwich year for that, so I think um, it would be better if you look for opportunities such as part-time job 
if you can manage or to uh, or to search opportunities during the summer. That's good advice. Uh, but but I have to say the question also asks about support. There are the UCL Careers has a really great resources for finding internships, and they're really helpful. They help you write cover letters. They help you practice for interviews. So really, really strong career support at UCL, which could also help you with finding a placement. Oh, <laughs> this is a. Have you seen this question? When beta lactamase is destroys the antibiotics, can we use ligase enzyme to join the antibiotics back together? I mean, in theory, there might be some way of doing that, but in practice, there's a there's a better way that we can spare penicillin, isn't there? There, I mean, if it's not working, it's that would be too much trouble. You just want to switch to a different antibiotic, I think, at that stage. Yeah, you can also use uh, beta lactamase inhibitors, so. Um, you had ampicillin and augmentin on one of your slides. So augmentin is ampicillin with a chemical called clavulanic acid. It stops the beta-lactamase from working. Yeah, there's a few combinations like that where yeah. you can kind of mitigate the effects. But ultimately, I think once, if you can't mitigate it that way, then, then you might as well just switch to an antibiotic. Oh, here's a question for Iris. Assessments, everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> exactly. Um, I would say it depends based on which year you are in and which module you selected. Um, for year one, it's mostly 50-50 um, between essays and MCQ. And um, for, for, for some modules, they might have like presentation oral based exams to replace these essays. And um, I think in... Year two and three, um, it would be more heavy based on essays. And how much there time? Wide, there is a wide variety of assessments at UCL. It really mm -hmm. depends on what modules you're taking. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question about the world free. Um, I think for year one, we spend almost like 80% of our time in the world free. And when it comes to second and third year, it is more and more based in the main campus in Bloomsbury. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a this is a very advanced question. If I apply to AMS as a fifth choice in UCAS, it affect my chance of getting into MBBS. I don't know. I'd probably want to put MBBS first if you really want to go to medical school. I, that's my. Or do you mean later? Or do you mean later down the down the line? No, I think you mean in UCAT the like UCAS selection. I think you should put MBBS as your first choice. You need to just focus on getting into med. If you want to go to medical school, you have to go all in. Put AMS as your your safe last choice. That's what I would do, because it's going to be harder to get into MBBS than it is to to get into AMS. You want to say something? We got like one. Oh, what? Oh, that's a good question for me. We have two minutes left. We have one minute left. I'll quickly say, what do I see? So what we, you need to make the marks. So you go into the website and you see what, what, what kind of grades do you need to get to get an offer? And then you write your personal statement and you just, you really lay out the case for why you want to be in AMS. Don't use chat GPT to write it right from your heart. We're not grading you on the English. Just, you know, be passionate, be, be yourself and, um, just show us why you want to be in the course. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for passion and, and interest. And we're, we're going to get cut off at exactly 1730. Uh, so I think if, if you want to the IB requirements, just go on the website. Everything's there. I think um, there'll be a link in the chat. I think we probably need, Iris, would you like to draw us to a close before we get rudely cut off? Okay. Yeah. So we are <laughs> Sorry about that. And we need to leave it there for today. Um, however, if you could please provide us with your valuable feedback about today's session by filling out our survey, which will appear in your browser at the end of this event, will be really, really appreciated. And thank you all for your comments and wonderful questions. And thank you so much, Professor Ron and Dr. Rustin, for an excellent session. Thank Have a great evening, much. everyone.
Bye-bye. Bye. Looking forward to see you.